Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Ash Whitener, and this is episode 41, Generating Passive Income with a Cryptocurrency ATM, with my guest, Cindy Zimmerman, computer scientist and crypto ATM owner. Cindy shares her story of getting hired as a Bitcoin developer after she helped a friend and Bitcoin business owner recover over $100,000 from a corrupted wallet, which eventually opened the door to her to relocate to Panama in 2013. While living in Panama, she earned a salary in Bitcoin, but there was a problem. Everyone still used the US dollar, and she and her colleagues were always running short on dollar bills. Cindy's idea was to purchase and run a Bitcoin ATM to help with the missing liquidity. Little did she know that there was a lot more demand for such a Bitcoin ATM and it would turn from a hobby to a unique way to earn passive income. Earning passive income is not easy. It requires a lot of hard work up front and an ability to execute on an idea. Do you want to get into the entrepreneurial mindset and be more prepared to create your own lifestyle of freedom and flexibility? Then head on over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to receive each week's podcast via email. Nobody's going to build freedom for you. It's time for you to take action. Also, keep up with us on social media by following on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. As always, show notes are found on our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com, and I hope you enjoy the show. With me today is Cindy Zimmerman. She is a computer scientist, as well as an early Bitcoin and cryptocurrency adopter. Cindy, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So Cindy, give me a very brief bio of who you are and how you got introduced to Bitcoin. Uh, I think it was back in 2011 or maybe 12. Uh, It was about 2012. My brother had mentioned it to me. And at first I didn't think it was real, but when I figured out it was real, I like most other Bitcoiners became obsessed over it for two days. Right. I became so obsessed over it that my mother, who's also a computer scientist, said, well, I now need to learn about this. So she says to me, let's go to a meetup so that we can learn more about it. We don't have very many female computer scientists, so I think it's really interesting that you and your mother are both computer scientists. I I consider computer science to be one of the most freeing skill sets that one can have because it's so in demand, you can contract. And, And I remember from previous conversations, I know that your mother was a contract computer scientist. How did that play on to you becoming a computer scientist and thus uh, an entrepreneur? Well, my mother, my whole family is computer scientists or traditional engineers. So it's not just my mother. It's, it's my mother, my father, my grandfather, my, my aunts, my uncles, stuff like that. All these people. But my mother became a self-contractor about the time I was born. Because it gave her a lot more freedom that she can work from home and she can be with me and my brother when we were kids and it just allowed her to basically have as full of a life as possible it allowed her to to work to be independent if she needed to and have money if she needed to but also take care of us and also spend time with us right so whenever you were going through school this appealed to you as well to be a computer scientist throughout you know, the course of studying and working, I realized that I was really good at coding (laughs) and I was good with computers because it was in my blood and I can make a business out of this. And I went more into that direction after a very painful road of figuring that out. So how did you get into cryptocurrency programming? How did this become your area of interest or your area of expertise? So my mother and I went to a Bitcoin meetup and from there we met the whole Quenipult team. But at the time, Quenipult was mixed in with BitInstant. 
And so we met both the Quantapult team and the Bidinston team. Right. And from this spot, I ended up working for Quantapult and my mother ended up working for Bidinston mm. at different periods, of course. Right. So you went to one of these Bitcoin meetups and you met, who, who did you meet there? I met Ira, Eric and Charlie. <laughs> Our buddies, Ira Miller, Eric Voorhees and Charlie Shram. You're starting to network with these guys. And I believe that one of them had a corrupted wallet that you you saw or you were able to help them fix. What was the story behind that? Ira and Eric were both working for Quinnipult and Bidinston at that time. But Quinnipult was the back end of sending Bitcoins for Bidinston for the exchange. And Quinnipult had a corrupt wallet and Ira was very, very upset about it. Finally, I turned around to him and I said, what is what's upsetting you? Because I, I didn't know any of the details. And he told me that the wallet for Quinnipult was corrupt. So after a few hours, I was like, I can help you with this. So the two of us sat down, worked together and basically uncorrupted or, you know, rebuilt the wallet and recovered all of the private keys, which amounted to a lot of money. And this was all due to, if I remember correctly, this was due to a memory leak that caused the wallet to be corrupt in the first place. And so this was really, truly like the wild, wild west of Bitcoin. This is when you really needed to know what you were doing. You really needed to understand your private keys. But we managed to recover everything. It was, it was amazing because <laughs> this was before I actually started working for Quantapulse. Right. So this was like your foot in the door. All of a sudden, all of these guys who are really well known and great entrepreneurs in the Bitcoin space, they were like, whoa, this this chick just saved us, you know, recovered a ton of Bitcoin for us. She's a good programmer. Uh, let's let's see if she wants to work with us. And you had an opportunity in your life where, you know, you were transitioning out of your current job and they invited you to come and start working with Coinable. Is that right? That's right. This was essentially my interview process, which I highly don't recommend this to be other people's interview <laughs> process. It was talk hard. about under the talk about under the gun interview. Yeah. It's not just answering a few questions. Can I get it right? Can I get it wrong? This was a lot of money at stake. A few months later, I ended up losing my own contract job that I was uh, I wasn't a full time employee. I was a contractor and and the project was up. I ended up turning around to Ira and I said, look, I can go look for another job or if you guys are planning on moving to Panama, I would basically love to work in Bitcoin. I would love to have this as a full-time job because this is more of a passion than most other things that I can do. And startups, I don't know anybody who's worked in a startup, you learn a ton. You learn mm -hmm. so much more than a regular job. Mm -hmm. So now you're turning one of your passions, which was Bitcoin, which was a hobby, and combining it with your interest and your skill set of being a developer. And now all of a sudden you find yourself on a plane moving to Panama to work for a Bitcoin startup. Basically. <laughs> so you worked for Coinapult and I'm, I'm quite familiar with this story because I was, you know, living and I met you and I and all the guys in Panama. And then, you know, you transitioned from Coinapult, which is a, a Bitcoin marketplace or a Bitcoin liquidity provider on to another hobby that you had picked up and something that you wanted to put your entrepreneurial talents into, which is Bitcoin ATMs. Can you tell me a bit about your idea on how you figured out that you wanted to try to, to run a Bitcoin ATM and what that's been like? Yeah. So I was working at Quinnipult and I was getting paid in Bitcoin because we're a Bitcoin company. And basically my idea is that I wanted to safely turn it into actual cash in Panama to spend in Panama, which I mean, anybody using local Bitcoins, local Bitcoins is a great place to do this, but it's not always super safe. You have to figure out if you can trust the person that you're exchanging the money with. 
Sure. And it's inconvenient. You've got to meet up with somebody. You have to sync schedules. You have to make sure they're trustworthy and think it's in a, a lit, safe environment. You know, there's a lot of obstacles that come along with using local Bitcoins. So you wanted to bring a Bitcoin ATM. So because you had a pain, which was, hey, I'm making all my revenue in Bitcoin, my salary in Bitcoin. But there aren't a lot of people in Panama that accept Bitcoin as payment. I need a better way to convert between cash or fiat and Bitcoin. And your idea was, let me let me just buy a Bitcoin ATM. I need this. And you're probably you're probably not the only person that needed it. So I basically bought a Bitcoin ATM knowing that there was none in Panama. So there was no competition. And I wasn't expecting there to be a big market because I didn't know how the Panamanians were basically going to perceive Bitcoin if they're going to want to use Bitcoin. It turns out that there was a bigger market than I expected. And most of those people happen to be Venezuelan. You bought the ATM because you wanted cash for your Bitcoin. And you thought that you could get a couple clients, the people that you work with who are also getting paid in Bitcoin, which they need cash as well. I know. You know, I know a lot of people that get paid in Bitcoin, they need to exchange it into fiat currency at some point. So maybe you're going to be your own client, maybe a, a couple people you work with your own client. But why did the Venezuelans living, the expat Venezuelans living in Panama, what what was their incentive for using Bitcoin? Well, Venezuelans incentive to using Bitcoin is most Venezuelan immigrants in Panama or throughout the world have relatives in Venezuela. And I'm, I'm sure most of your audience already knows things in Venezuela are very grim. There's, there, there's a large black market for food. There's a large black market for medicine. People are basically starving. They don't have toilet paper. They don't have basic stuff like soap. They, they black out on Fridays or something like once a week or two days a week. To try to save electricity, right? Ba right. So because they're having drought issues on top of the oil price going down, their currency has basically went through hyperinflation to the point where Ford motor vehicles stopped producing cars in Venezuela, saying, we can't do any business with Venezuela, we're done. And if you can't have Ford get dollars in and, you know, to convert some boulevards in and out of Venezuela, what makes the average citizen able to do that? It's hard. Yeah, exactly. So to give a little bit, a bit of background to the listeners, the official exchange rate is 10 bolivars, which is the currency of Venezuela. It's 10 bolivars to one U.S. dollar. That's if you go on Google, you'll see that this is the official exchange rate. But the free market exchange rate, what you can actually get is 1,000 bolivars for one dollar so this is a factor of 100 that is if you go on the free market you can get a lot more bolivars for one u.s dollar and essentially what happens is if you try to bring dollars into the country or you try to send a bank wire with you know back home just you know remittance remittance payments basically then you're going to get a terrible exchange rate and lose you know 90 percent of the value of the money you're sending back home Exactly. Right. With Bitcoin, what happens, Cindy? So with Bitcoin, they can exchange it closer to the black market. They can exchange it closer to 1,000 bolivars per dollar in Bitcoin. It's also a way of getting it more securely and faster because if anyone's tried to send a wire through the bank, an international wire, they know that it takes three or four days when all conditions are perfect. Yeah, Venezuela's on the OFAC list as well, if I recall correctly, from you know my knowledge in the offshore banking sector. And a lot of the times, you can't even send a wire to Venezuela. It's prohibited. It's too high risk. So not only you know is it extremely difficult for them to send money home, remittance-wise, to send money back to their family in Venezuela, you know, they most likely won't even be able to send the send the wire. And if they do, they're going to get a 90 percent reduction in their purchasing power whenever it gets deposited in their family's Venezuelan bank account. So it's there's nothing free about that. This is producing more poverty because of this artificial exchange rate of 10, 10 boulevards to one U.S. dollar. Exactly. So my customers 
basically are capable of going to the machine and exchanging US dollars for Bitcoin almost instantaneously. There's no middleman, it's just me and the machine. Once they get that, they can automatically send it to their relatives. So within five minutes, their relatives could have Bitcoin in their hands. From there, they basically can exchange it for dollars or use it to buy goods and services. Venezuelans particularly trust the boulevards so little that they'll use anything other than boulevards. And that includes dollars, that includes Bitcoin, that includes, I don't know, goods and services, pencils, gold cattle, and silver, yeah, whatever they gold can. And silver. Basically, anything is better than a boulevard. Right. So now they have the freedom to choose a different type of currency that they want to try and preserve their wealth in. In this case, it's Bitcoin. But they they can store Bitcoin as a store of value, which, yeah, okay, we understand Bitcoin goes up in price, it goes down in price, but compared to the Bolivar, it's relatively stable. It's extremely stable in comparison to the Bolivar, and it's retained way more of its value in comparison to the Bolivar. Even when it went down like 30%, it was still up in comparison to the Bolivar to the dollar on the black market. Yeah, because we're looking at Bolivar inflation of like a thousand percent. And so even if Bitcoin drops 30% in value, it's it's nowhere even close to the thousand percent inflation that the Bolivar has seen where the purchasing power of the Bolivar has been absolutely diminished and, and just it's been a catastrophe. So what Bitcoin is allowing is Venezuelans to store their wealth in Bitcoin and then whenever they need Bolivars to purchase something, they can go and maybe use the local Bitcoins or go to a meetup group or something like that and then start selling off parts of their Bitcoin and get the Bolivars from it for a much more favorable rate than they would get for, you know, through a conversion via wire transfer. Yes. And they're happy with the service because they're getting they're getting more purchasing power for their dollar. I'm happy with their service, with the service that I provide them because I get dollars that I can now spend in Panama versus the Bitcoin that's harder to spend on Panama unless I'm buying something on Amazon. It's just a win-win for everyone. And it's safe because they're not sitting there dealing with a person on the street. And it's not as time consuming for either of us because they can go to the machine when it's convenient for them. And then I can go to the machine for to exchange my Bitcoin for cash when it's convenient for me. Right. Yeah, because some people go to your machine because they want Bitcoin and some people go to your machine because they want dollars. And for everyone that doesn't know, Panama uses the U.S. dollars, their official currency. And so this serves your needs. You know, this was just a pain that you had. This was a pain that you wanted to solve and it wasn't being solved in Panama. So you bought a Bitcoin ATM and had it imported or whatever you did because you wanted to use it. You were their first customer. This is a good, this is a good, uh, heat check on if you think that your business is viable and it has demand for it. If you want to use the, the goods or the services that you're, you as the entrepreneur are trying to create, then you know you've got at least one customer, you, and that's your proof of concept. Now understand why do I want this and what other people are like me that could also want this service. And now you're really starting to get a viable business plan. And for you, right. it was for you and other Bitcoin holders. And you, you didn't even realize that the Venezuelans wanted Bitcoin whenever you started, but it turns out they did. Right. So since starting this project, I have had... I've had Venezuelans, especially, who have been interested in buying Bitcoins. I had some speculators who have been buying Bitcoins. But I've also had people approach me about buying their own machine. And these are people who don't have a lot of technical skills, but see the business value behind it. And with enough questions, I've ended up morphing my business into franchising. So basically, I'm now offering to provide technical services to help set up a Bitcoin ATM for my customers, especially in Latin America, who don't have the technical know-how. 
Right. So you started by buying and owning and managing your own Bitcoin ATM. It was successful. Other people wanted to emulate this, but they didn't have the technical or the programming experience to get it up and running. And so now instead of continuing to buy ATMs, what you're doing is you sell AT Bitcoin ATMs to people in Latin America and help them with the technical yes. aspects of it. Oh, well, that's very neat because this started out as just a pain that you had and, and almost like a, a hobby to being a successful and profitable Bitcoin ATM to now franchising Bitcoin ATMs and supporting these people with your technical experience. Yes, but they lack not only in technical experience, but some of them also lack in understanding where to go to buy in more traditional markets. Because most of my customers, or many of my customers, I should say, who go to use the ATM don't really want to use the banking system. Venezuelans for obvious reasons, but they also have problems getting bank accounts in Panama, being that they're Venezuelans and their legal status isn't always up to par because right. they're more in a refugee status. But a lot of people don't like using the banking system. They don't trust the banking system. Basically, the ATM gives them a way of, of interfacing cash to Bitcoin. But this isn't for everybody. And the people who want a franchise do need access to the banking system. Right. And you assist them with uh, understanding what the requirements for the banking side is and understanding the requirements on the technical side. Yes. I think that you've got a large rollout of new ATMs coming soon, and I believe that you've integrated other cryptocurrencies. Is that correct? I have four Bitcoin machines that are already with software integrated to also include Dash into it, which has some demand, which is why we ended up integrating Dash into our software. So my machine not only sells Bitcoin, it also sells Dash. It doesn't have as much demand as Bitcoin, but I see it becoming more in demand in the future. Bitcoin is just more in demand at the moment because there's more purchasing power with Bitcoin. Yeah, there's more market for Bitcoin currently. It's better known. It has a larger network. You know, it's been in the news. People feel safer. If you're starting to get into cryptocurrencies, you're most likely going to go into Bitcoin first. Dash is a very interesting cryptocurrency that Liberty Entrepreneurs supports Dash 100%. We love currency competition. And I've actually interviewed the creator of Dash, Evan Duffield, back at the Latin American Bitcoin Conference in Mexico City in December 2015. If you want to know more about Dash, check out that interview. I'll link it in the show notes. But Dash is really interesting because it has quite a few differences as opposed to Bitcoin. Some of them are very noticeable, uh, yes. a different, a different governance system. You know, one of the yes. big things in the, in the Bitcoin space right now is how they're going to come to consensus to increase the block size. You know, I had Eric Voorhees and Roger Veer on the show just a couple of weeks ago discussing this and the Bitcoin community hasn't been able to, to come to a consensus and either keep the block size or raise the block size or lower the block size, whatever they want to do. But Dash has a governance system, whereas yes. there's a, a voting mechanism built into the protocol that you can submit an idea and it can get voted either up or down. Yes, Dash has a very strong governance system. If you own a master node, it gives you voting power in saying what the system should do, what the system should, should proceed with, where investment should go. They have say in how to spend the money kind of, which is basically their government system. And they, they basically can pay developers to create new things, to create new software or new infrastructure for the Dash network, which right. provides a huge following for it. But what makes it very unique for ATMs and very good for ATMs is that you have an instant confirmation which is really important for ATMs because you want that transaction to be as quickly as possible. You basically want that when someone hands you a dollar, that you get a dollar's worth of Dash immediately. And Dash is much quicker and much more instantaneous than Bitcoin. Not that Bitcoin is slow, because in comparison to traditional stuff, it's not. 
Dash is just a little better at this. Right. Where a traditional bank wire, if you're sending international, is going to take anywhere from three to 10 business days. With Bitcoin, it could take anywhere between five to 30 minutes, maybe more depending on uh, the block sizes and, and if there's space. With Dash, it's just a matter of seconds. So if you can think about this, you go to an ATM or you go to a restaurant and you spend Bitcoin. Well, that's going to take maybe 30 minutes to confirm. So you've got to sit around and and wait for 30 minutes until the conf- the confirmations come in for that transaction. With Dash, it's much quicker. And this, again, is something built into the Dash network. Another interesting thing about Dash that I really like is uh, the dark send. At least it used to be called dark send. I'm not sure what it's called now. But this is a way to add privacy. Yes. You, you know, everything on the Bitcoin blockchain is open. It's an open ledger. Basically, you can go in and you can take a look at every single Bitcoin that's sent on the network and from the address and to the address that it's going to. Well, with Dash, it gives more privacy to this if in the sense that, you know, maybe you don't want 100 percent of your transactions being on an open ledger. I mean, people can't just look into your bank account. Well, the normal person cannot. But with Dash, it gives you an extra layer of privacy and security. Dash does give you an extra layer of privacy and security, but it also allows the user to be more open if the user chooses. It gives the user more of a choice than Bitcoin does. Bitcoin just doesn't give a choice. Right. And so have you seen Dash Demand or is this a preemptive integration to add Dash to your ATMs? And I haven't heard about another ATM that supports Dash. Are you the first Bitcoin ATM owner to integrate Dash? I am the first Bitcoin owner to integrate Dash. We've had a little bit of demand, not very much, but our market is also much smaller than the U.S. market because Panama has about 3 million people in this city as opposed to New York City that has about 10 million, 15 million, something like that. And so there's just less people, less demand all the way around. Uh, Even on the Bitcoin side, there's more demand and there's more competition in New York, just as an example of city size. But I see this growing in the future when people like the Venezuelans can figure out what they can buy and what they can purchase with Dash, they'll figure that'll be more useful. Right. So let's go into the freedom segment of the podcast here, Cindy. Sure. Uh, it's, I mean, it's pretty obvious the freedom that this is provided, but I want to hear it from you, the actual entrepreneur who has created this knowledge around not only Bitcoin, but Dash and other cryptocurrencies, as well as the, the technical knowledge, the banking knowledge, you know, to set this up. This is a lot of systems that is working here. This is a lot of information that had to be collected. How is this providing freedom for you? And how is this providing freedom for your clients? For me... This was a culmination of a lot of things that I've learned over the years. And so it took a little bit of setup and it took a little bit of learning curve to get everything up and running. But once it's up and running, it it becomes more of a passive income stream because it's not a nine to five. I don't have to sit there and watch it 24 seven. I send myself email alerts that I set up myself and so I can be, you know, on a beach and I can get email alerts of what needs to happen and I can control everything from my phone if I need to. I go to the machine to pick up some cash when I need to. Again, this is all revolving around my schedule. Now, of course, this is new. And so sometimes you have a, a couple of hiccups here and a couple of hiccups there. So then you have to go deal with them. But for the most part, it's, I don't have to be in an office nine to five Mm -hmm. for my Venezuelan customers. It's freedom because they can send money with, they can basically send cash with very little interface with third parties and it's more secure for them. So we've already went into detail about how this affects my Venezuelan customers, but for my franchise customers, again, for them, it's a little bit of setup. It's a little bit of an investment with their own capital, just as if you were buying stocks or bonds or something like that. And you have to research stocks and bonds or you have to research 
any kind of investment that you're going to do. So there's a little bit of research and learning curve to get over with this. Once that's set up, it becomes more of a passive income. You don't need to monitor it 24 seven. You can have your own life. You can have your own job. You can do other things. And it gives them the freedom to basically put their capital to work. And in today's world, let's face it, there's very little yield in traditional stocks and bonds, specifically bonds. There, there's very, very, very little yield in the world. Right. And so if you can set up something to create passive income, then that's, that's really great. That is a lot of freedom. You know, I've thought for a long time, all you've got to do is figure out how to passively earn the amount of money that you use that you need every month to survive. Let's say you're living on $3,000. Well, if you can set up some, create a ebook or you do have a Bitcoin ATM or something that requires very little work, you know, just a couple hours a week, and you can start passively generating that $3,000 a month that you need to live on. Well, boom, you're, you're free. You're financially free. You know, you can go to the beach for a week and not really worry about it. You don't have to sell your time nine to five to, yeah. uh, you know, some other entrepreneur who's running a business. You're the entrepreneur. You manage your time now. You manage your expenses. And as soon as your passive income matches your spending, maybe your passive income needs to go up, maybe your spending needs to go down. But as soon as those two match and your passive income either matches or is is more than what you're spending per month then yes when i when i was working a more traditional job especially when i was working at a startup and i wanted to go on vacation i always had to make sure all my work was covered i always had to make sure that someone else can cover my work or i had a laptop with internet connection that i can always check now i don't worry as much about going on vacation I don't worry as much about taking time to do whatever it is I need to do in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week. It's given me a lot more freedom in terms of time. Then you have to worry about when you have more time, you end up spending more money and then you need more passive income and it becomes this little bit of a vicious cycle, but that's life, right? Yeah, exactly. No, I I think it's great, Cindy, what you've done. You've turned a, a problem or a pain that you were experiencing yourself in Panama where you couldn't get U.S. dollars and you were getting paid in Bitcoin. You figured out a way to solve that by buying and managing and setting up and running a Bitcoin ATM so that you and your fellow Bitcoin friends who get paid in Bitcoin will have an easier and better way to exchange into U.S. dollars. And then it turned into a business, which it didn't sound like you were expecting with the expats and specifically Venezuela right now, and being able to offer them a service that greatly improves the quality of life that they have, not only because they don't need to ask for someone else's permission to send money back home to their family, but they get to keep the majority of the purchasing power of the money that they're sending home. So you're definitely helping the unbanked. You're helping people who are desperately fleeing the country to try to create a better life for them and their family. It's just a a really great project, Cindy. I appreciate what you guys are doing. And, you know, it's very interesting also how early you got into Bitcoin and how, you know, it really clicked with you since you have a computer scientist type mind. And it just seems like a a really good combination for you. I hope that other people become interested in this and they can start setting up Bitcoin ATMs around the world to help people freely move money and and keep their money from inflating. If anyone wanted to get into this business, Sandy, what advice would you have for them? Well, if anybody wants to get into this business, they can easily contact me. But if you wanted to get into it on your own, there's a lot of Bitcoin ATM machines out there varying in many different prices. You would have to do a lot of research about what works best for your particular situation. And of course, with owning a Bitcoin ATM, it's all about location. And so... I know people who want to own Bitcoin ATMs and they want appointment only because they have a a certain type of client that they're looking at. And then there's people who want to own a Bitcoin ATM who service and cater the general public. These are two different kinds of clients and people who want to own these kind of Bitcoin ATMs have to think about what is the best location because it differs 
from what type of client you're looking for. You also have to realize what country are you in and what is the legal atmosphere. So I noticed that there's a lot of demand for Bitcoin in Colombia, but because I'm uncertain about the legal landscape about Colombia, I haven't actually put an, AT an ATM in Colombia. And if anyone is interested, I would love for them to contact me. Um, you can contact me at Cindy at tigoctm.com, T-I-G-O-C-T-M.com. And I would be happy to talk to anybody about this. If you still, if you wanted to do this on your own, you would need a lot of know-how about not just the physical machine, but also about the technical setup, about banking, about where is the right exchange for you, how, how to make money. There, there's a lot of factors on top of the legal landscape that I, that's my weakest point because I'm not a lawyer and it changes not just country from country, but in the U.S., it's state to state. The legal landscape is different. Right. Well, it sounds like you've got a wealth of knowledge here, Cindy, and it makes sense through your journey of computer science and Bitcoin and, and living in a foreign country and being an expat. It's, you know, I hope that if someone is interested in learning more about this, they reach out to you and maybe you can help them franchise and get a Bitcoin machine up and running. I'd love to see more Bitcoin machines with our friends down in Buenos Aires, Argentina, if you're listening like you said, Colombia is a great place. This is just a, a wonderful way to help people send and receive money to their friends and family without having to get approval from a third party that has very little reason to to get into this whole mix and tell people no, they can't send money to their friends. And it helps people preserve their wealth, which is ultimately one of the most important aspects of freedom is being able to retain your wealth because if your wealth is being inflated away, it doesn't matter how much money you make because it's not going to be worth anything whenever you go spend it. So, Cindy, I will include your contact information in the show notes and a link to your website. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. You've just listened to episode 41, Generating Passive Income with a Cryptocurrency ATM with Cindy Zimmerman. Wouldn't it be nice to help people send money home and to friends and family? and also make a profit doing it? Do you see yourself on a beach somewhere while a Bitcoin ATM generates revenue for you? This is just one more example of how Liberty entrepreneurs around the world are building a more flexible lifestyle for themselves. And you can too. If you want to learn how to become a Liberty entrepreneur and live a lifestyle that you choose, then sign up for our newsletter at libertyentrepreneurs.com. Until next time, keep building freedom.